Good afternoon. My name is Kyle Roberts, and I'm the Associate Director of Library and Museum Programming at the American Philosophical Society. Welcome to today's virtual discussion celebrating the recent publication of The Power of Maps and the Politics of Borders, a special issue of the transactions of the American Philosophical Society. This volume is based on the proceedings of the Society's 2019 conference of the same name, which traced the creation and use of maps from the mid 18th century through the early Republic to show the different ways in which maps produced and extended the physical, political, and ideological boundaries of the new nation while creating and reinforcing structural inequalities. Now, if you haven't been, had a chance to purchase a copy of the book yet, I've got mine right here. Uh, it is available today for a 21% discount uh, for all who have registered for today's talk. We're going to put that discount information into the chat. Uh, basically, it's discount code POWERMAPS21. Uh, so I strongly encourage you to get a copy um, at this great discounted price. Now, before I begin, I want to acknowledge that the American Philosophical Society resides in Lenape Hoke, the homeland of the Lenape people, whose historical relationships with the land continue to this day. The APS acknowledges with respect their continued presence and perseverance and expresses its sincere thanks for the past and ongoing generosity of numerous indigenous communities and individuals who've offered their guidance, their expertise and opportunities for collaboration. For those joining us for the first time, the American Philosophical Society was founded by Benjamin Franklin in 1743. The society is a catalyst for the discovery of new knowledge. Election to membership honors those who've made explicitly significant contributions to science, the arts and humanities, and public life. The society promotes research by providing over a million and a half dollars in research grants a year, primarily to younger scholars who need the support the most. Our library and museum collections and research centers serve scholars and visitors from across the globe. Please check out our website, amphilsoc.org, we'll put that in the chat as well, to learn more about what we do and for news of forthcoming events. Now we're using Zoom webinar today, so not to worry, you have all been muted. If you have a question, please use the Q&A button at the bottom center of your navigation bar. You might want to just locate that now, it's right down there on the bar. You can type your question in there at any time. There will be time at the end of the presentation for questions with our discussant and our speakers. Finally, we're also offering closed captioning for this presentation today. If you'd like to use it during the presentation, please click on the CC box on the bottom navigation bar of Zoom. It's right to the right of the Q&A button. And with that, I am very pleased to introduce today's speakers, all of whom had participated in the 2019 conference from which the volume came and whose work is featured in the volume. Our discussant for today's event is Nicholas Glisserman. Dr. Glisserman is an independent scholar in the fields of history and geography and is currently earning a degree in computer science. He was previously the chief academic officer at Game Learning, where he designed and developed six historical video games. Joining him for this conversation are, is uh, Derek Kane O'Leary, Julie Reed, uh, and hopefully Katie McKinney. Derek Kane O'Leary teaches at Bard High School Early College in Washington, DC, and will be a postdoctoral teaching fellow at the University of South Carolina, beginning in the 2021-2022 academic year. Derek completed his PhD at UC Berkeley in 2020 and is working on a book manuscript entitled Building the American Archive in the Atlantic World, 1776 to 1876. Julie L. Reed is a citizen of the Cherokee Nation and an associate professor of history at Penn State University. Julie's research focuses on Southeastern Indians, the history of social welfare and American educational history. She's currently working on her second book, tentatively titled Land, Language and Women, a Cherokee and American Educational History. Her first book, Serving the Nation, Cherokee Sovereignty and Social Welfare, 1800 to 1907, examined the move from kinship-based systems of care at the turn of the century to the development of national social service programs and institutions, including pensions, a prison, a mental health facility, and an orphanage in the aftermath of the Civil War. Uh, unfortunately, there's been a power outage at Colonial Williamsburg, uh, so Katie McKinney, our third speaker, we're hoping will be joining us at some point, um, but if not, that's why she's not able to join us. Uh, she is the Margaret Beck Pritchard Associate Curator of Maps and Prints at Colonial Williamsburg, where she oversees the collection of prints, maps, and natural history collections. She holds a master's degree from the Winniture Program in American Material Culture at the University of Delaware. 
and a BA in art history and history from James Madison University. The, uh, and she is also a curator, helped curate the first map exhibit to open in the new Carolyn and Michael McNamara maps and prints gallery in the expanded DeWitt Wallace Museum at Colonial Williamsburg. And that exhibition is on now. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Nick Lisserman to be our discussant for today. Hello, everybody. It's uh, great to be with you. And uh, it's really wonderful to see Derek and Julie and hopefully Katie soon. Um, so I thought we would just begin with a sort of a light question where, where our participants could introduce their projects. Um, tell us a little bit how about how they've evolved uh, since the conference, how, the, how maybe the conference, the process of writing um, the, the article for this volume has helped shape their work. Um, and, and I understand that everybody has an image or two that maybe helps to crystallize what, what their work is about. So uh, please, sh you know, show us, sh no, don't just tell us about your work, show us your work. And I'll, I'll uh, hand it off to uh, Julie and Derek, and then if Katie shows up, uh, We'll, we'll let her say hello too. Thanks. Adriana, I'm gonna ask that you um, show my, share my image if you could. So I am um, not a historian of maps as, as my introduction made clear, <laughs> um, but I had the opportunity back in 2015 to begin going into some caves in the Southeast um, with what appeared to be early uses of Sequoia's syllabary th throughout caves in a variety of hands um, for a variety of purposes. And I'm a historian. And so what am I doing in a cave looking at archival material? But, and, and so that was exciting in and of itself, um, just the sheer magnitude of these cave spaces. But the space itself and reading a document in a cave became um, it blew my blew my world apart in so many ways. I was writing a book on Cherokee educational history that I thought was going to be a strictly an institutional history. Um, and then I go into caves to read documents. But these documents were unique in that they are written everywhere. So there's uh, pieces of what's written on the walls to my side. There are elements of the script um, on the ceiling above me. And you can see myself and Bo Carroll, who's one of my co-authors on a couple of pieces, um, who is an Eastern Band um, Cherokee in Indian member and also a PhD student at the University of Tennessee in archaeology. So here we are in these caves. We're having to crawl along the ground to look at what appear to be single syllables. Um, we're looking at walls that are at our, our height. And then we're having to look ab above us um, at the ceiling itself to read. And immediately this, this complicated any reading of documents that I'd ever previously done, not only because I was in a cave doing it, but that there was something spatial about it, that it wasn't enough to just read a cave wall in order to fully appreciate what my ancestors were doing. Did I have to read this space three or possibly even four dimensionally? Um, you know, was there a level of dimension, dimensionality that was necessary um, to read this space? And that changed the entire trajectory of my second book project in and of itself, because it moved me into an archeological period, thinking about these caves as much older spaces that pre-existed um, Cherokees as we know them today, but certainly were cornerstones of ancestral Cherokees. Um, and at the same time, got me thinking about what the, where this cave was, what it was in proximity to, what the community it was connected to um, also had going on in that moment. And so reading this space, both relative to its distant past, but also reading it to it, its historic present and thinking about all of these relationships. And so that led me to look at some maps. Um, and I, again, I use maps, but I don't, um, I've never treated them in the way that I treated them both for this publication, but also the ways that I've treated them since then for the purposes of thinking about spatial relationships. So 
you know, one of the ways that I thought about these maps was both the authorship of maps. So when do we get indigenous informants and or indigenous map makers and how are they reckoning space? Um, and how is that unique or different from how non-indigenous map makers are are reckoning space and creating borders. And, and there are some clear distinctions that are, that are easy to make. At the same time as a couple of the other pieces in this volume make clear, Cherokees are astute and they know what's going on relative to borders and they know what's going on relative to how map making is happening. Um, and so what this cave and this, the, the, the spatial qualities of this cave told me were that Cherokees continued doing and thinking about their cosmological worlds and mapping them in certain kinds of spaces in ways that were much older. And they used new technologies like the syllabary to do it. But outside of these caves, they're also using new technologies um, relative to treaty making, relative to boundaries, to kind of assert sovereign rights to um, European colonial powers, but then to the, the young United States during this period. And so I, you know, I've increasingly tried to put space at the center of my work. So maybe not maps per se, although maps have been a tool for doing that, um, but thinking about the spaces that people occupy and what shows up on, on maps over time and, and what's not on maps. So caves are not on maps in, the, in this very early period. And yet caves are a space that people are interested in both for resources, um, but they're also interested in them in terms of, again, in terms of indigenous histories, there's, there's an important, important piece to this, these caves themselves. And so really thinking about all the ways that people are reckoning space and, and thinking about space that are, again, are making their ways onto to, to maps as, as you'll see in this volume, but that are also, again, a part of an older cosmological landscape that people are, are living on and, and learning from and continuing to use um, to, to understand the spaces around them. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop there for that question. <laughs> Should, should I jump in, Nicholas? Yes, tell us about your project. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, absolutely, and I'm uh, so grateful to everyone at APS for making this conference and volume possible. I really think it's an excellent undertaking and hopefully resource for teachers and students. And uh, thanks to, to Julie for that term that you used at the end, uh, reckoning with space, which actually helps me think about uh, what I'm doing here. So uh, like Julie, I am, I'm no expert on maps, um, though in a sense, uh, my then dissertation, now book project about the history of American archives in the Atlantic world is a type of spatial history. Um, archives could seem like dusty places. They could seem like sites of nostalgia. Um, my observation and argument about archives in the early United States, mostly in the form of historical societies, is that they were anything but. Uh, indeed, they were interested in the past, but they gathered the materials of the past in order to think about a larger historical trajectory that the United States was living into, that it was diving uh, into the future uh, based upon. And now this is mostly state-based and local undertakings prior to the existence of national archives, but the people engaged in this thought they were doing national work. And they did so in an international context. Um, as I'll mention in a moment, gathering materials from abroad in order to build what they thought of as the nation's archives. Uh, and though that's a very textual process, it's about manuscripts, um, it's also a type of spatial thinking. Uh, many of these archives called upon people, uh, a broad range of people to gather topographical information, information about rainfall and natural features, uh, among a wide array of other things, all of which would find their way into these new archives. So um, the bigger story that they were telling, though in different ways and sometimes contentious ways, was about the conquest and settlement of American colonies, their rise and emergence into nationhood, and the uh, growth 
of these states as independent entities within the nation. And the, the map that anchors this project um, kind of crystallizes, I like that word, Nicholas, um, this bigger process in a very literal way. Um, the Webster-Ashburton Treaty is not the most known treaty in American history. It seems kind of provincial. Uh, you can see it up on the map. It was negotiated in the 1840s between Britain and the United States to determine the boundary between Brunswick, New Brunswick and Maine. Uh, on this map, you can see the competing lines that Maine and the United States argued for, that Britain argued for in response, and then betwixt the two, the actual line that they settled on in that negotiation. Um, and my paper uh, focuses on a particular map allegedly uncovered in French archives by the leading collector of historical manuscripts in the antebellum US uh, by the name of Jared Sparks. And this map uh, is allegedly that of Benjamin Franklin um, sketched out during uh, the negotiations leading up to the Treaty of Paris, in which allegedly he traces in a red line where this boundary should B. It's questionable claim by Sparks. It's not authenticated. And this map ends up playing this really important role in the negotiations that lead to the determination of the boundary. So in a literal sense, uh, this one piece of paper taken from a foreign archive ends up playing a substantial role in the determination of actual land under the control of US sovereignty. So kind of a, a literal encapsulation of the bigger project of what uh, American archives were doing in this period. I'd like to say more about what, what ends up happening there, but um, just to, to return to Julie's great phrase, it, spatial reckoning, um, though not always in the form of maps, is, is part of the process of building historical archives in this period. One of the things that I love about um, getting to have a panel of people together and, and a conference that puts different top, very different topics into conversation is I think we get to see some real similarities. And, and in the case of you two, I just, um, I think the word that in, in common that stands out to me that I didn't even think about until I was hearing you, you know, talking today is, is archives. Because I think, Julie, what you were showing us is an archives of a very different sort maybe than, than uh, what, what Derek was showing us. But, um, you know, when you said it's not on the, on the maps, you know, that there's a sense of let's, let's keep these things hidden or let's, let's not reveal everything. Um, because because the Cherokee are you know intelligent actors and they understand European ambitions and it's kind of the same thing, uh, Derek. When when uh, you know in your article you talk about Jared uh, Sparks, you know trying to get into these archives and he and he's kind of <laughs> fooled around. So you, you know there's there's a real recognition. Um, uh, you know, that, that, that you, you want to be careful who you do and don't let into what you know and into your memory and into your spatial memory, your, your, the spatial memory of, of a people, right? So um, with, with that in mind, it sounds like Katie is, is uh, maybe, is she here? I'm trying. Yes. I'm, I think I am. Okay. <laughs> okay. So um, Katie, <laughs> Welcome. Hi. It's great to have you here. Um, we're, we're just at the beginning of this. If, if you could tell us a little bit about your project and we'll uh, have somebody put up your map image. But yeah, please tell us about your project. Sure. Thank you so much. Um, I'm so sorry. We um, about 10 minutes before I was supposed to get on, there was an area wide um, power outage and the uh, cable outage and all that <laughs> internet. So do my best. I um, hope I can keep on the whole time. But anyway, um, this has been a wonderful project to work on. I've been really um, honored to be a part of it. Um, it gave me personally the chance to explore some objects in Colonial Williamsburg's collection um, and think about ways to, to bring them together. So I, I wrote my chapter on around a map um, that was published in 1782 by Sebastian Bauman, who was present at the siege of Yorktown and uh, served in the American Revolution. But he published this map in Philadelphia. And although it wasn't um, very different from the maps of the siege that were published by British and French map makers, it held a special importance, not only in its creation, the fact that it was made in America, but also it, that it was celebratory in nature. Um, 
Robert Scott the Engraver created this exuberant military cartouche around the description. And then there's a, a point on the map um, in the center of the map, what my uh, predecessor Margaret Pritchard calls the heart of the map called that says the field where the British laid down their arms. So um, that that poignant kind of <laughs> reminder of this is sort of where it all began is what I was thinking about when I started working with the map. And um, it really became the iconic representation of the siege of Yorktown, so much so that it was copied many times and then um, copied significantly by a man named John Francis Renault, who uh, was sort of a very, is a very interesting character who claimed to have been at the Battle of Yorktown, not sure he was, but he um, several decades later published a copy of Bauman's map that he had redone, that he had drawn it himself and published it with a, a print depicting the battle. So um, I wasn't, I'm so sorry I wasn't able to be at the conference and I didn't get to see the exhibit before COVID happened, but I know that Bauman's words were present in the exhibit. Um, when he was publishing the map, he stated, um, and indeed, what is a country without maps, a history of war without plans. Um, and I think that he really saw this map as sort of a starting point for history, for the country that he had fought um, to secure. But at this point, he was trying to secure his place in that memory. And um, I think that's also how John Francis Renault used this map. So, um, you know, rather than attempting to create a new map of the United States, which would have been way outside of his skill set or purview, he created a map that isolated Yorktown as the birthplace of the American nature nation and designated it as a kind of starting point for American cartography. Um, I think that if Bauman kind of helped lay the groundwork for that, Renault decades later was fashioning his own contribution, also using it. So um, for me and the article, I, it explores how the map was used kind of as a vehicle um, through which both of these men could legitimize their place in the United States, in the new United States. So um, really thinking about it as, you know, what's on, what's how these people um, were thinking about this moment. Sorry, that was <laughs> kind of rushed. It's been a, a little wild past couple of minutes, but that's, that's the gist. <laughs> no, that's great. Thank you. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, you know, I think one of the, the fun things about all three of your pieces, they get at this question of, of historical memory in, in very different ways, you know, and sometimes because, you know, what you remember, the, the map is or the images are devices to help you remember, to help, but, you know, they are not the only, the, the only things known in a society are not the, necessarily the only things encoded. I think, Julie, that's what, what your work really speaks to. And Derek, you know, it's, you can only remember something if you can locate it and you can access it. And, uh, you, you know, uh, Katie, I think, think what we get from, from you is the sense of a map tells a story about a people. And, and that's something that can be tampered with or edited over time as it is republished and, and reintroduced to an audience and put into different contexts. Um, so I, I'm really curious to know a little bit about, and I, you know, one of the reasons I wanted all of you here is, is precisely because maybe you're not, uh, you're, you know, your first and foremost interest is in, in, in uh, maps. Um, and, and, you know, I think that you're using them, you use them for this conference to, to engage with your primary um, area of interest. Um, and I, I'm really curious to hear a little bit more ab about that. How is your thinking about maps as sources changed? Um, and, and maybe one way to think about that question or a different way to, to rephrase it is if you were giving advice to yourself or to, uh, to, you know, to yourself in the past before you, you embarked on, on this, uh, in this conference or, or to, you know, so to somebody who, who was thinking about working with maps, what advice would you give them? And I guess we can just go in the same order that we went in originally. So I'll, I'll shoot it to Julie. Well, you know, as a historian, you know, who's constantly interested in kind of changes and continuities over time, it, it was incredibly helpful for me as a starting point just to gather a lot of maps to look at um, and figure out the relationship from one map to the next. What's present on one map that 15 years later isn't? What's, um, what shows up again and again and again? And, 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 and this was important to me for, for thinking about um, 
again, the ways that ma perhaps indigenous map makers are not in the mix, but are continuing to articulate the importance of places over time that may not have that same central place politically, um, but that do still hold um, importance um, either symbolically or historically for Cherokee people. So, um, you know, I should say that my, my current book project spans a really long chronology. It's about a, a thousand years. And the first two chapters really take the archeological uh, records and use maps pretty closely in ways that I perhaps didn't, again, didn't anticipate. Um, but, but side by side with that, I kept thinking about, well, yes, I've got these big spaces to work with and I've got big chronological spaces to work with, but how do I put these, um, these geographic spaces in relationship to community spaces? So every chapter tries to do that. So I, each chapter is kind of an educational space broadly construed, um, but draws upon how we're mapping those geographic spaces and then how communities are actually using those spaces um, in the everyday. And uh, if you read my chapter, one of the things that I did imaginatively was kind of create a child to interact with these spaces and, and think about the perspective of, of, of map makers who never were, right? Um, or who were who we don't know about. Um, you know, that we, we can't preclude that, that children and women were not participating in some of these activities. And so that um, trying to imagine these relationships to space has led me to, again, kind of think about, well, what are, what are, the, what are the consistencies over time? So the presence of the town of Gadua, which has been continuously occupied for 10,000 years, continues to show up on maps over time, even when Euro-Americans are saying, oh no, these other towns are way more important. Um, and, and so thinking about that as, as a way to um, challenge myself to think about how significant those spaces are to Cherokee people over time, um, but also challenge myself to think about new spaces that are that are coming into play um, that I that I have to reckon with. And um, you know, additionally, I um, I would say just look at look at as many maps as you can by as many different authors as you can, and recognize they're all plagiarizing. Like that was the other <laughs> the, the 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 big kind of discovery for me, not having ever thought about maps in any real way, was the the ways in which map makers are continuing to rely on previous maps and just reproducing many elements of those maps, um, and so knowing that was incredibly insightful. Um, and at the same time, that also gets at like, with Cherokee people are introducing these sites in a very early moment, they're being reproduced because Cherokees thought they were significant, um, both at a certain point in time, but that also by sharing that information, it's going to be embedded through these maps over time, whether non-Cherokees like it or not, um, just by the map making conventions of the day. So, um, I, I have enjoyed using them. I can I can imagine using them again. And I'm also um, disappointed when I can't find the maps I'm looking for to help me kind of guide myself through a new space. So, so yeah, they've become a bigger part of my life than I anticipated for sure. Well, that's the goal. <laughs> um, yeah, I think there's there's so much um, great stuff in, in in your in your answer, and and I think. Um, you know, the, the question of why do maps get copied? Why do people copy maps is, is a really excellent one. Why, and, and sometimes why are they not copied? Why do we not have them? But is it is it laziness? Is it because that's all we have? Is it because this is something important and we want to reaffirm it? Um, so I think that's, that's really great. Um, Derek, what advice would you give to your past self uh, knowing now what you know? Uh, thanks. And, and I think this picks up on Julie's last point about plagiarism, but more broadly, the, the social and, and textual context that maps emerge in. My, my biggest takeaway is that maps um, are imbued or endowed with meaning uh, within the social cultural context that they exist in, but they can also be sapped or deprived of meaning. That is, and, and this is true of any historical text or artifact, but I found it especially true of the map 
in my paper, which might not even exist. It's, there's a there's a potential question mark uh, on my map at the center of this this whole paper. Um, for, for decades after the Treaty of Paris, Americans and Britons and others had tried to figure out where the US Canadian border was, and they produced no shortage of maps and other textual surveys of that border. And it was only with this alleged uncovery by Sparks of a map in the French archives um, with this red line seemingly determining where the border is, that it seemed possible to cut through that. And Sparks, working with Secretary of State Daniel Webster, used this map, which to their um, dis discomfort seemed to support the British claim rather than the American claim. They used this map to get the main delegates to support a treaty that asked for less land. So it was a, a way of herding cats to the negotiation table. Um, so the map was endowed with meaning in that diplomatic uh, political context. But then when the treaty was signed, the ink was dry and it became public knowledge that uh, Sparks and Webster and, and US con uh, senators as well had known about this map, but not told it seems the British negotiators. Some people were outraged, some, some British politicians were outraged. And in response to that, Sparks, Webster and others, they backtracked and they said, well, the map wasn't really that significant. We don't even know if it's the real thing or not. So there's, there's this um, kind of ebb and flow of the meaning attributed to this map. And, and my takeaway from that for, for myself and others is um, we need to um, appreciate the map or whatever the resource is as a, as a fluid item within whatever the context is. It doesn't have a stable meaning, but a meaning that can be manipulated, um, enhanced or, or diminished um, based on the, the interest of the people who hold the power over it. Yeah, I think that's great. And I, you know, just thinking about the title of this, of this volume and the conference, The Power of Maps. Well, there's no monolithic power here, is there? And I, I think that's one of the things that all of our contributors show so brilliantly is, is exactly what you were saying, Derek. It's something that, that ebbs and flows, it's, it's contextual. It's, you know, the map maybe has some power in this moment and maybe it's not quite the power you would think it would have, right? So, so it, it's, it's, not, it's not helping us um, to prove our point in a, in a treaty or, you know, in, 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 a, you know, in a delegation, but hey, it's help, helping us to, um, you know, br bring bring our own internal, uh, you know, people with our own set of internal interests to the table and to get them to go along. And then, then when it's no longer convenient, we'll, we'll say, oh, no, 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 no. Um, great, Katie. What 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 do you wish you knew then that you know now? Yeah, um, I. I think when I first started working with maps, which really wasn't too long ago, it was maybe five or six years ago, um, in the role that I have, um, I curate the prints and maps, so the, all the graphic materials and the prints I felt very comfortable with from my background, but the maps I was so intimidated by. And I think um, I, I wish that I'd, I'd known, <laughs> you know, then all of the different ways you can look at them. And I quickly started to learn that through great mentors and um, people throwing really interesting sources in my way, but the thing is they are very intimidating because they're so complicated, but at the same time, there's so many different ways to look at them. And I think this volume really shows that. And the two other panelists really explained that as well, pretty well, that, you know, there's just, there's so many different avenues. There's social history, political history, military history, which I think are sort of on the surface, the surface of, you know, thinking about them in terms of empire, these different instruments, but there's also so much more within the maps and beyond the map. And I think that this volume, um, really captures that very well, that there's so many different perspectives and angles and disciplines that can benefit from re-examining maps and using them. Um, I think of, I work with them and think of them as, think of their physicality um, and think of what sort of how they moved around in space, how they were created. Um, and those are all things that, you know, I felt feel comfortable talking about and realize it's all there. There's so much that you can do um, with maps. So I think for anyone who's really interested or is a little intimidated by taking on <laughs> working with a map, um, find the thing that interests you and it's all there. Great. Um, and so maybe growing out of that a, a little bit, Katie, um, just to, to follow up because, and then I kind of want to broaden this out, but you know, 
as, as somebody working in public history and Derek and Julie as, as uh, people teaching, is, is there anything from the conference could be somebody else's map, could be, you know, an article in this volume, uh, could maybe a new approach, a new topic, any of these kinds of things. Um, ha have you found that you've brought anything specific from the conference into your work in a more public facing, uh, you know, role, te teaching a public, teaching, you know, students in the classroom, wherever it might be. Uh, Katie, I'll, I'll start with you, but, uh, yeah, is there, is there anything from the conference you bring into your work now? Uh, definitely. I've learned so much from um, all the contributors. Um, I was sad I wasn't able to be at the conference in person. I was I was ill at the time um, with the flu, but I um, through reading and then um, watching the lectures, which was really exciting um, <laughs> to see um, streams lectures. Now that's very, you know, we're all very common. It's very common now. But um, one of the things that has really um, stuck with me and that I, I really can't help um, but think about now when I'm working on an exhibit or writing something is, is um, I think I said it earlier, is kind of looking beyond the map. And I really like Billy G. Smith's project um, and article that he writes about in the book, um, as well as Julie and some of the other contributors who who pushed beyond what it what a map kind of is, you know, beyond it being this printed um, recorded document, but thinking about it in terms of how individuals move through space and think about maps. Um, so kind of going beyond the map, um, um, Billy uh, G. Smith's project. Um, explores a walk around Philadelphia from the perspectives of Martha Washington and Ona Judge, a woman she enslaved, um, to look at a lot of different things like race, gender, epidemics. It was really inspiring to me. And um, I think that project, that which helps put people back on the map, um, is something like how Julia reminds us that women, children, um, people who are um, poor, people who are, um, are marginalized are nonetheless active participants in the spaces that these maps represent. Um, so it's something that I'd like to bring further into our exhibitions and museum to help encourage some of our visitors move beyond the idea of, you know, the map and to think about uh, who's represented, who's not rep represented and why. Great. Um, Derek, Julie, what, as, as teachers and as people thinking about teaching, what, what from the conference have, have you brought into the classroom? Uh, I don't know if one of you, what, do you want to, Derek, do you want to start us off? Uh, sure. I, uh, I'll i echo some of what uh, Katie said, which I certainly agree with. Uh, I think it's a scholarly question too, but I think it's it's really pivotal in classes. Um, using maps as one of the, the many resources we use to destabilize students' sense of what the United States is, um, showing the expansion of the American Republic or empire as a contested and uncertain process where lines are anything but indelible. Uh, I think seeing maps as sites of contestation for that, that larger question is, um, is a great thing in, in the classroom. And uh, in another other sense too, and I'll also shout, there, there are many good articles in the, in the volume, but I'll shout out uh, Billy Smith's as well, which I think it could really be an excellent source for students in um, US history survey classrooms. Um, seeing these maps from different human perspectives and imagining um, those maps as, as embodied places um, and then putting those into conversation with our, with our own sense of, of space today, uh, I think is a really has a lot of potential for classrooms. Great, and Julie, I, I, I can't wait to hear what you have to say because your piece is so much about education. Yeah, well, and I've thought about this too through the lens of like, what what can we do now technologically um, that we couldn't do before? So I, you know, I often obviously there's a there's a number of kind of really good indigenous um, digital maps that are available to say like whose lands are you on for for the purposes of land acknowledgments, and I, I and I see that as a useful tool, but I also back to Derek's point about these kind of contested boundaries in the, the, the early Republic, but also um, at, over time, even before that, right? That there's this way in which do we now have a responsibility to create overlaid maps so that, so for instance, when high school students are getting um, a one-dimensional map that just accepts that these borders 
are what they are in any given moment, like what an opportunity to overlay indigenous claims to those maps. What an opportunity to, to, to show some of the contestations or unclear boundary lines, even amongst Euro-Americans that exist, right? Let alone introducing questions about indigenous people's claims to land. But I mean, what a way to potentially blow the minds of high school students who get these maps and just think this is this is what's it, this is it. And in fact, it wasn't it then, and it isn't that clean now, right? As we discuss land, land back movements in the larger indigenous communities across the nation, but that there's also, again, kind of really fruitful ways to make this complex around just map making, right? Not even looking at like other kinds of spaces like caves that don't show up on maps, but just the maps themselves should be far more contested digitally um, than what we've ever been able to do before in terms of what's possible. So, and I'm, I was thinking about that because I'm actually evaluating some high school and middle school textbooks right now. And I sat there looking and just thought, I want to blow all these maps up because none of them, none of them work. Right, none of them are, are a true and accurate representation, even in that moment of exactly what's going on um, with boundaries. And, and so, you know, I mean, it's great that the Cherokees and the Chickasaws get so much representation in this volume from my perspective, but I think even in terms of, of the volume and thinking about how Cherokees and Chickasaws are contesting each other's claims to land, right? That, there's just layer upon layer of contestation around maps and borders that 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 this can provide. Just simple overlays um, digitally could could expand teaching opportunities in so many ways. Uh, if I can just respond, I, I'm I'm like excited by this this way of thinking about it and this provocation. It's my intention to give a series of map quizzes this coming semester to my U.S. history survey students of, of the colonies in U.S. over time, but. How, how in the world would a teacher do that in a way that accounts for these, these many different cartographic um, perspectives? And but, but I feel like that could be productive in the classroom too, thinking about those, those overlays, so to speak. Sorry, class, there was no right answer. You all fail, I guess. <laughs> um, no, I really love, I really love this uh, conversation because I think it again points us to the way that the power of a map shifts and we can flip it on its head in you know, in the present, uh, maybe using new techniques. And so with that, I'm going to switch into some audience questions. And I think I've got a really good one um, to launch off of, of this, this question of um, using digital techniques um, to, to flip maps on their heads. So uh, uh, one question is, uh, our maps today are mostly digitally rendered. Do you, uh, panelists, see more continuity or difference from the historic maps you have all looked at? So maybe another way to, to think about this is what happens when a map goes from a paper or a rock or some you know, kind of a <laughs> physical surface into a digital screen? This is, um, this is a question that always comes up when I get, when we give a tour in the gallery. It seems to be what really is, it fascinates people and, and it fascinates me too. Um, people looking at historic maps and saying, well, how accurate is this? Or what was this accurate? Um, I think that's kind of part of that question. But I mean, I think putting, be what we can do digitally with map overlays, things like that. Um, it can tell us, it can tell us Oh, it can kind of tell us so much and I think only so much and it's sort of like with Derek's chapter is about boundaries and borders and you know what the maps are trying to figure out um can we ever get an accurate map <laughs> you know I think is another question um a, a stray thought I I feel yeah. that um it, it's possible if if it, when you look at the maps in this volume, many of them have fuzzy lines or sparse spots that are not filled in. Um, so not only are they just from a perspective, but they're from a perspective that has um, much less than quote unquote comprehensive knowledge of the space. I, I feel that our, our digital maps can mislead in a way or send a, a, 
um, a message of comprehensiveness or absolute knowledge, yeah. um, which exactly. is not yeah. representative of, of much of reality. I, I think especially in, in a, a world of um, more global flows and porousness of borders. So there's a way in which I think um, precision can distort uh, what, what knowledge actually exists or what actually exists on the map. Great, thanks, Julie. Do you, do you have any thoughts on this on this question? I I feel like I concur. Like that, there's a way in which um, I I like some of the again. Like I, I'm thinking about the Cherokee Nation's recent project with Google, but all of the five tribes, especially in the wake of McGirt decision, now have ju jurisdictional boundaries drawn out on Google Maps, right? Um, and that excites me, right? And on the other hand, I get that even within that, there's a lot of contestation around those boundaries that's going to be ongoing. So um, I, you know, as I love the idea of like just um, you know, complicating this stuff in all sorts of ways so that we we see how um unclean and unneed it is in, in, in any given moment, right? And so um I, you know, I I don't I don't want something to be final, I guess, because it's, it's never final. Um, it's constantly undergoing challenges. Great. Um, so we have a number of questions directed at individual panelists rather than necessarily the whole panel. Um, so, so Julie, uh, can we think about the authorship of the inscriptions in the cave? Do they have a relationship to the space of the cave? They, they do. Um, but all in their own unique way. So, and, and again, I say that all in their own unique ways. And then, oh my gosh, there could be something collectively that I am never going to fully appreciate about this, how this, how this is working within this case. So, so for single, the single syllables, you know, there's, there's a way in which we had to ask ourselves, like, are the single syllables about practicing writing the syllabary for Cherokee people? So is it just a practice space, right? But there's also a way in which we have to ask ourselves in this really interesting acoustic space, is this about song? Is it about the way these syllables sound in this space that means something bigger? Um, you know, for the narratives, because there are actually narrative descriptions, um, and this, our, our group authored, co-authored um, antiquity piece kind of talks through this particular in inscription, but it's referencing a, a ball game, a stickball game. And so the idea is that the stickball team is probably in this cave in order to have isolation, in order to have a, a body of water where uh, the spiritual and ritual practices that have to happen around that ball game can take place, um, where ceremonies can be conducted in, in private. Um, and then the, the, the ceiling itself has a different kind of spatial quality because it's written backwards in a way that it's not meant to be read by those of us who are standing on the ground. It's meant to be read by those who are looking down from above. So there's something happening spatially to kind of how Cherokee structure the larger cosmological world of kind of the, the, the lower world, the mid realm, the middle world where people occupy and then the upper realm where um, larger cosmic entities um, live and, and are. And so there, there are all sorts of communication happening that are unique to the spaces that are being written on. But then again, like what do I have to read this document altogether to understand some other element of what's happening in here that, that we can't ever possibly know? I mean, that, that, I guess that's the part that both keeps me fascinated, but also um, leaves me unsettled because there are just things that I will never know, right? That there are ways in which I will never be able to reconstruct what's happening spatially in this cave, um, even as I can sit and wonder about it um, all day, every day, as I'm thinking about these spaces. And then of course, again, having to put this cave in relationship to the larger towns and communities and, and people that are beyond that cave that have a relationship to that space that are maybe not in it. And so um, I think there is something really 
powerful and meaningful on a whole variety of levels happening relative to what, where people are choosing to write and what they're choosing to write. That's, yeah, that's fantastic. Um, so this, this is a question for Derek, but maybe we can draw it out for all of our panelists. Um, who gets to say in, in the map making? Is it surprising that a collector is part of the process of drawing national boundaries? I, I mean, I think one of the things that was so delightful about all of your pieces is, yeah, that that's like, who's, who gets to be a map maker? Who, who gets to have a say in map making? Um, Julie, I think you really pushed our boundaries of, of, of that question and thinking about, um, you know, this, this hypothetical Cherokee girl as, as somebody who's learning, as somebody who's in, embodying knowledge, embodying all sorts of uh, knowledge that, that isn't may, maybe necessarily explicitly recorded in a historical treaty or something like that, but maybe exists in the background. And, and um, Katie, I, I think about your two map makers who are using the map to legitimize themselves and make them, that, you know, give them a sense of belonging within this new nation, um, people who would maybe otherwise in, in be considered outsiders by some. So, uh, so yeah, is it, Derek, is it surprising that a collector is part of the process of drawing national boundaries and uh, Julie and Katie, who gets a say in map making and <laughs> what, what can we learn from that? It's a great question. I, I, I think it's, it's not surprising that institution, major institutions, um, people with substantial political and diplomatic power or, or social capital generally are leading this process and superintending the, the meaning of this map and what it can do in a, in a diplomatic context. Sparks is um, adjacent to power. Um, he activates um, US ministers, he hobnobs with um, foreign politicians and people who have access to the French uh, national archives. So, um, you know, adjacency to power or control of power itself. Um, so it doesn't, it, that doesn't surprise me um, too much. I, I think the interesting thing to, to point out just on this question of, of power and access to maps is that the United States had absolutely nothing like the vast national archives that uh, the British and the French and, and also other countries had at this point. And it's, it's from this position of a sense of deficit or deficiency um, that Sparks is operating. Um, a belief that certain things belong within the American archive um, that they, they are the papers of the nation. There, there's in fact a, an article in the Treaty of Paris that calls for the return of all archives and records. The same article in fact that calls for the return of all slaves, which is interesting. Um, and um, Sparks is acting on that, but at a time when uh, American institutions cannot do what European institutions can do as far as controlling cartographic knowledge and, and putting it to work. Yeah, well, I want to take a minute to just, you know, not just think about my own work relative to the Cherokees in this chapter, but of course, Austin Stewart and Lucas Kelly and Jackson Pearson are also kind of looking at what, what Native Southerners in particular are, are doing relative to maps. And, and to Derek's point, like, there's an absolute knowledge. I mean, there, there's almost a parallelism, right? That on the one hand, the young United States and these up and comers are, know they're at a deficit relative to certain kinds of documents and certain kinds of capacities, but so do native people. And so there, there's a very parallel kind of process happening about, we understand how power is, is and, and borders are being constructed. And so we're all going to be a part of, of working through this process and attempting to, um, to lay claims to borders and contest borders. Um, and indigenous peoples are very much part of that from the very beginning, which I think is, is an important um, part of all of this, right? Is that indigenous people aren't just sitting by the sidelines watching the Americans make maps. Um, they're, they're right there saying, we understand that power and sovereignty is attached to these practices and we're going to participate as well. Um, and yet at the same time, kind of recognizing their own spatial relationships. And so that's what, you know, one of the things relative to indigenous map makers is that they're, they're choosing to um, 
identify spatial relationships really different. So the Kataba deer skin map, which I highlight in, in my chapter, is one of those in which where who gets put in circles is really different from who gets connected through straight lines. Um, and so those relationships get placed on maps by indigenous map makers, but a lot of that's gonna fall away as kind of um, map making gets more sophisticated, gets more standardized, and indigenous formants get relied upon less or whose contributions get um, pushed aside or ignored in future renderings. And so I do think there's something to be said for how if indigenous map making had continued to develop side by side or had been able to develop um, of, of its own free will, perhaps, what the maps might have looked like side by side um, with non-Indigenous map makers and cartographers. Like, I think that would be fascinating. And we have a, a good sample size to say they would have looked really different. And what they chose to represent would have looked very different as well. Finally got Zoom to work. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I, in thinking about Bauman and Renault, so the two map makers that um, I wrote about, I was speaking with one of my colleagues who's a military historian, and he said, with, if this, if he had never made that map, you would never really known his name. You know, he would have been kind of a minor figure. He, in New York, you might have, he became a postmaster and, and things like that. But I think that the map was, for him, he jumped on the chance to kind of fill that deficit that Derek is talking about, that a chance to create, you know, create something kind of first or um, and ingratiate himself to his uh, superiors. The map is dedicated to George Washington and we know that he gave copies to his superiors and, and um, military colleagues. And um, I think that one of the things that being able to expand on the project and, and from the conference, what I really thought about was like, who was not on the map? Um, and think about at the at the siege of Yorktown, the military historians also get mad when you call it a battle, it was a siege. <laughs> the siege, they, uh, there was a, um, there were a, there was a large number of um, people who had been enslaved who fled to the British lines who were dying in large numbers in Yorktown because there was a, um, a smallpox um, outbreak there and the British army um, just was inundated with all these people who were coming to them for freedom and they were they ex were expelled and so that story is obviously not captured on the map um bauman himself you know he he was certainly one of the the people and wanted to position himself as one of the people in america that would have access would have power to create to create maps and i think that's something that renault um was also um very conscious of but i think so as much as it's important to understand why he made this map and who, it's important to understand who we made it for and who the map doesn't consider and therefore kind of this idea of, of America, um, what that looked like to them. So we're right at two o'clock. So I just wanna wrap things up um, and give each of our panelists a quick chance to just say, give a final concluding thought. Um, and, and maybe that can be, what new question do you have about the early Republic after writing your piece, coming to this conference, all of that, um, participating in this panel, of course. Derek, do you want to go first? I know you have to leave. So. Uh, well, this is, I think, the hardest question that you've saved for last with the least amount of time. So, um, but as I, I think it, to something I said earlier, um, to what extent can we use maps to, to reconsider, to look more deeply at uh, the contested nature of um, the, the form that the American Republic or empire took in these years, um, rather than just um, post facto proof or um, of, of what happened. Great, thank you. Julie? Well, I, again, I think for me, it's just led me to constantly ask how other people would have reckoned space that like, that maps are both useful tools, but there, there's also a way in which there are so many other ways of, of making relationship to space um, that isn't about empire building, that isn't, that isn't about military supremacy, that isn't about colonialism in all of its forms. And so, you know, I've really 
hope to kind of challenge myself about like how to, okay, yeah, rivers, but what are women and children's relationships to these rivers and what are they learning from rivers and what does it mean to kind of occupy a smaller space, you know, thinking about animal ranges even. So what does it mean that this, this set of bears would have maintained a space within this area? And what does it mean that, that Cherokee women and children probably would have remained closer to a particular space and then had a, a different kind of intimate knowledge of that space? And so um, I already said, like I'm using maps all the time, but it's also a way for me to kind of flip the, the, the challenge myself to say, okay, but, but what would I get if I asked somebody else to create a map of the space? And, and so I think we have to constantly do that relative to the maps we're using of like, if other people had an opportunity to map their worlds, what would it have looked like? Great, thank you. Katie, final thoughts. Oh no, so that was, that was Julie, that was wonderful because I think that this process has made me think about exactly a lot of those questions is um, how, and, and something you said, pointed out earlier about kind of uh, putting um, native maps of native space next to the map, existing maps that we have. Um, those are those are things and the, these are, I think the volume and, and some of the work in the volume helps, um, I mean, has expanded my my knowledge because I, you know, was seeking how, you know, how would indigenous people think about space or where do you see them on these maps? But I, the, the volume and the chapters um, on, on those topics have really helped <laughs> um, expand my own knowledge and hopefully can keep asking questions. But I think, um, I think just the concept of looking, looking beyond what's on the surface um, and questioning um, what we're seeing and asking some of those deeper, those deeper questions. Um, that's what I know I'll carry with, carry with me, but it'll help, you know, has expanded my knowledge, my ideas about what early America, early Americas were in art. Thank you. Great, well, thank you to all of our panelists. It's been a pleasure speaking with you today and I encourage everybody listening to get a copy of this wonderful volume and reading all of the wonderful pieces in it. I don't know if there's any other uh, business. Does uh, Kyle, do you have anything else to say or are we good to go? All good to go. Just to thank you for a wonderful event uh, and we will see everyone next Wednesday uh, for a talk with Sarah Pomeroy and her new book, Benjamin Franklin Swimmer. So do join us if you can. Thanks everyone.